the theme this month is big data. What does the city know about me? And today on Skype, I'm having an interview with Saskia Sossen, a renowned sociologist and writer on cities uh, at Columbia University in New York. Saskia, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Now, we know that you lead a cosmopolitan life between London and New York and, of course, the rest of the world. And I'm curious, do you have any idea what London and New York know about you? Um, I must tell you, I've never asked myself that question because, I mean, one of the features of big data is that it is big. So the, the, the items get buried in vast data sets. It is only when something else happens outside the big data space that they will activate those big data resources to find out something about me. So my critical vector, I'm not about to get worried about the big data gathering. I object to how it gets used, that's another matter. But big data per se is sitting there. It's being gathered. The question is, what are the intersections? You know, what, how are they going to make it work? At that point, it can get very tricky and very nasty, clearly, for some. Are you worried about your privacy, given all these huge data sets? You and... know, I must tell you that I'm a bit weird here, and I, almost politically incorrect, I would say. I cannot get myself worried about that. Now, that mm -hmm. comes out of several things. That does not mean, by the way, that I don't object to it. I feel that I am fine. I have been willing to speak in public for the record with multiple YouTube, uh, you know, filmings of stuff. E enormously critical statements, and including stuff that it is in the public domain, but it is not necessarily always known or understood that it is in the public domain. So I always say, look, this is in the public domain, but this and this is happening. So I, I think they know everything about me because I speak about it. But there is also something interesting about the fact that if you publish a lot and all your negative observations are out there, it doesn't matter anymore. You see, it doesn't matter because we are really powerless. They know okay, what you think already. Yeah. <laughs> um, do cities that use big data, does using big data automatically make a city smart? Definitely not. I mean, same thing with chalking it full with smart technologies, as they are called, does not necessarily make a city smart. In fact, my argument is that much of the design of smart cities generates a city that is not smart enough. They're pretty stupid, actually. And, and so actually there's an enormous amount of losing intelligence, smart observations, knowledge bits, you know, local knowledges within a city. Because these systems are not ready to, to, have, uh, to have this knowledge become part of the knowledge-making circuit. The grandmother who has lived in a neighborhood for a long time and who has time to observe what happens in the neighborhoods, right? She has knowledge that the urban expert in the city government probably does not have. What would happen if each neighborhood in the city actually has an open access uh, network attached to it where people can sort of drop insights? Some of it will be nonsense, some of it are bits of knowledge. We've got to have that type of conversation and that means open sourcing these closed systems and not you, assume that you, the expert is the only one who has the best type of knowledge. Indeed. You've written before that uh, uh, technology now is being built into cities in such a way that it's becoming invisible and that makes it impossible to have a dialogue. Yeah, I think that that our learning curve, you know, confronted with new technologies, for your average person, I don't mean the experts, your average person is probably being prevented from being sharper and better because so much of it is wrapped either in the container thing which is flat and doesn't produce any knowledge because it is not transparent either, or because all these built-in systems are not visible to us. Every place should have some site 
where whatever the, te the, te the technology and the engineering at work is made visible. So that while you're waiting, your mind goes to that. Rather than complaining, becoming impatient, trying to you know, get ahead of the person in front of you, all negatives, I mean, why not be there and looking at this machine, even an elementary machine like the automaton, no, where you get your ticket. Sorry. And in whose interest is this, Saskia, to have this dialogue? Is this in the interest of business, in the interest of city governments? Of course, it's in our interest as citizens, but who is going to make this happen? I think businesses have come to understand that that open sourcing a bit is not a bad idea, that it is a whole other business sector. But frankly, I don't care that much about what, what if the businesses suffer, they will have to adjust. I, but the character of the evolution of the technology and how it actually installs itself in places and how it becomes part of the lives of people. The notion that specificity, locality, the, your own obsession that those can also become activated and that you connect with others who are like you, know, all of that, I think, can be done with this technology. It, does, it allows you to exit some generic level that more standardized technologies, which are centrally commanded, do not allow. A community would come to life that way. I mean, I just think that, I'm now still thinking about the neighborhood, you know, which are the forgotten actors. And you said uh, before that you thought that uh, Amsterdam Smart City was one of the better examples of the use of technology to improve life in the city. The, the Dutch really are, are far more active, you know, in, across different neighborhoods, across different spaces in the city than, than people, say, in London or in New York City, where it's, it's a more specialized domain, you know. I have the impression that urban space in a city like Amsterdam is a, a, a space that is far more organized than meets the eye. I know that when my mother was dying of cancer, she lived in Zuid uh, Amsterdam, that suddenly, in her block, when they understood, and she was still living in her home, that she had cancer and was in treatment, suddenly various members of that block appeared, and it turns out they were it's some part of organization. They took care of her. They went to visit her, you know, uh, they, whatever. And that kind of being, they, they watched at night, they were on call. If she had a problem, she could call. I mean, and this is block by block. So there are these multiple strata. Now imagine if you plug into that some of, some of these types of, you know, interactive technologies. What it could do in order to animate a neighborhood and its concerns, you know, there are so many wonderful possibilities. It's not just about information. Is this what you mean by open source urbanism, using technology to uh, improve neighborhood contacts, uh, the social tissue of the city? I think of different types of mobilizing people, of making them active in networks, as one point in a trajectory that can then increase the levels of activation, increase the levels of complexity of what the issues are, etc., etc. Now that's one part. The other part really has to do with how do we enable central, powerful, and necessary actors, such as certain parts of city government, certain parts of the health system, you know, the formal, I don't mean the neighborhood in formal nursing, but I mean the big hospitals with all their, you know, machines and, and, and specialized forms of knowledge, you know. So the more activated a neighborhood, the more potential there is to really work. So it is both the center of the system and the neighborhoods, and they can mutually help each other. And Now, we haven't talked about other systems about big data. I was just in going to ask, sense. how can we use these vast data sets to, to drill down to the neighborhood level to really make life for us as individual city dwellers more significant? Well, you know, there are, there are multiple um, sites, places, where there is a kind of a possibility to begin to, to, to enable access to the technologies, besides, you know, the learning, etc., but also that you can begin to think of networking with your neighbors, creating a network space. There is always a big footnote. There's always a possibility of abuse, you know, that one crazy person is completely continuously invading. The, the, the 
I would like to propose that those kinds of issues should be seen as the challenges, the level of complexity of doing that at any level when you have open sourcing, right? And, and so that kind of stuff, you know, these are all challenges, but I always say these challenges should be seen as challenges that are on a learning curve. So once you capture one challenge, your neighbor who talks too much or accesses too much tells you too much, right? Well, then the next one, and capabilities are created that way. So I really think that learning again how to be makers is a critical challenge. It's sort of an image that I have that, we are no longer makers, we are consumers. And so this is also about making. This is not about just, oh, eliminating the nuisance. No. This is a making process, you see. To me, it, it becomes a whole web of opportunities, connections, and, and minimalisms. I really think that the key here is a certain kind of minimalism, not strong and down and, you know, all the way. No. Minimalism. The neighbor who writes too much, okay, it's made part of the group so that she sees, oh yeah, this is all of us, this is, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Isn't that a nice fantasy? That is a, well, I think it's, it's more than a fantasy. I think it's a new reality that we're moving towards. And I'm very happy to see that in among all the concerns for our privacy and the, the way that we're being manipulated by, by business and also by government, that there's also enough uh, room for optimism and, uh, and new challenges and new social connections. Yes. So, it's been wonderful speaking with you. Thank you very much, Saskia. You'll be the star of the evening, and I'm looking forward <laughs> to uh, sharing your thoughts with our uh, public at Stadsleven later today. Fantastic. I wish I were there alive. <laughs> I wish you were. Thank you so much for joining us through Skype. Bye. Bye-bye.